Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm absolutely be delighted to welcome Bob Miglani, who is in new, lovely, hot New Jersey today, right? That's right. How are you? <laughs> Good. And uh, Bob is the best-selling author of the uh, a book, Embrace the Chaos. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, but there was one thing I was just saying before coming on air. Um, Bob had what most kids would probably think of the dream childhood, like growing up, running a, helping his family run a Dairy Queen. And for those of you outside the States, uh, you got to try the chocolate-dipped uh, soft serve. It's the best. <laughs> um, so, and then, and then Bob... Bob, um, you know, was going through a lot of things in his life, decided to take a trip to his ancestral homeland of India. And that, Bob, changed your life uh, and uh, and uh, was the basis of the book Embrace the Chaos. Could you, so can you talk us through what led up to that and how that became such a seminal moment in your life? Sure, sure, John. Thank you very much for having me. I uh, love uh, sales pop and I think uh, you're doing a great job. So thank you for having me. Uh, so my story is I came here to America as a kid with $75 in my pocket with my parents and we got into the Dairy Queen business mm -hmm. and it was a great time running if any for, for a lot of uh, salespeople we grew up in family businesses and you know one thing to be true which is you work all the time and you never get paid. <laughs> So, but we learned valuable lessons in that Dairy Queen experience that led me to a, a, a corporate career uh, where I, I had a lot of success and growth at Pfizer. I worked at Pfizer starting as a sales rep and I became a number one sales rep and I grew through the ranks and I was at Pfizer for 23 years. But at some point in my life, in my career, it was 2008, anybody remember 2008? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm, I hit a wall, as a lot of people did, and there was a lot of uncertainty around me. Even though I had such massive success Mm -hmm. In my career, uh, I found myself I stuck where I looked at the future and everything looked hopeless. You know, there was people I'd go into work in the morning, I'd swipe my corporate ID, and I would cross my fingers hoping the green light would turn on. Uh, I found myself stressed, stuck, anxious. And here I was, performed every year after year after year, but just was slipping down this spiral of anxiety and doubt because – there was so much uncertainty. People were getting laid off. There's a lot of cuts for lots of different reasons. Some not performance space. So mm -hmm. I thought to myself, hey, that formula that I knew that I grew up with of work hard and everything will take care of itself wasn't working. And so I found myself uh, in this space of, you know, sort of worried all the time, anxious and stuck and stressed and, and not being able to perform. I had a friend named Ben. He, he called me out of the blue and said, Bob, I'm going to India. Come with me take some time off, show me around the place. I said, why do you need a tour guide? <laughs> so we go to India. I take a week off from vacation. I said, yes. I said, sure, Ben, I'll help you. So he was working on some uh, energy projects, which I knew nothing about. But he said, Let, you know, show me around, introduce me to people, and I know lots of people. So we met, you know, the prime minister, who's the prime minister of India today. We met him when he was governor. We met lots of CEOs of companies, everyday people. A week, a week is over. John, and we're heading back home and he says to me, Bob, I don't get it. India is so confusing. How does anything work in this crazy place? And I smile, you know, from going to a meeting, the meetings are three hours late and you never know who's in charge. You know, the CEO is not talking, it's the, you know, somebody else. And, and, you know, just a lot of craziness goes on in India, as you can imagine. And he said, how does it work? I said, well, Ben, have you ever been to an Indian wedding? And he said, no. I said, well, it's very instructive of learning to deal with all this chaos. Right. Because Indian weddings are huge, mm -hmm. 800, thousands of people sometimes, you know, they're three hours late, you know, the flowers are not neatly arranged on the, on the table, they're all over the floor, there's a priest on one end, there's a guy drinking scotch out of a car on another end, you know, there's a horse and an elephant, and you can't be sure, but it's not for the kids, you know, but, you know, 18 hours or sometimes three days later, mm -hmm. two people get married. Right. It works out in the end. Mm -hmm. If you focus so much on the order and things in terms of what's coming or what's written on the invitation, if you focus so much in the order and things, you're going to miss the best time of your life. Right. It's going to go by like that and it's going to work out okay in the end anyway. And so what you have to do is to embrace the chaos is what I instructed mm -hmm. to do. And on yeah. flight back, I realized that's what I needed to do in my own life, mm -hmm. in my career in New York City at the top of one of the biggest companies in the world. I needed to relearn how to embrace the chaos. 
Yeah. And so that's when I started my process of rebirth, reinvention, regrowth. And that led me to you know, reduce my stress. I grew my career. I made more money. I got more responsibilities where before I was think, you know, concerned I was going to get laid off or get cut. And so all of that was the, the impetus was that trip to India when I said yes to my friend and I learned how to re-embrace chaos. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I love this. I love the stories. Um, I think it's so fascinating that um, we we tend towards this idea of trying to control things and trying to have everything work neatly, and that's not how life really works, right? I mean, we we try to control so many things that are outside our control. Is that part of what you went through? Was kind of releasing that need to try and con- to attempt to try and control things that you can't really control. That's absolutely right. I think there's two things, John. You hit one. You hit right on the head. Is this notion that you know we feel we have control and and salespeople. And I was mm-hmm. uh, you know I grew up as a salesperson. We're type A. You know we yeah. need to know mm-hmm. the best. We need to learn the best. We show up. We do our homework. We show up earlier than everyone else. So we often find ourselves when we're in that mode is to control a lot of things. And what I realize is that the world is so complex. Yeah. You can't control it. John, I have trouble controlling my kids to think <laughs> I'm going to control you know, my career and all of that. You can't control those things. But the good news is what you can control is your words you, that you use, the thoughts you think, and the actions you take. Right. That's where we should focus our efforts. And when we do that, we begin to live a life of, of, of success, I think. But the other thing I learned is that you know, there's this notion of perfection, John. And then there's this great story I tell in my book, Embrace the Chaos. And, you know, I speak a lot and I talk about this story. It's about me trying to catch a bus and uh, in India. And so it's really basically was I was asked my cousin in India, I said, you know, I take a bus. He says, you can't take a bus, Bob. You're not from Rhode Island. I said, no, I want to do what locals do in India. I want to take a bus. So well, he goes, OK, we go to the bus stop. We're waiting. It's like a dirt road. He's like, OK, get ready. The bus is coming. I said, what do you mean? And I look over. <laughs> And there's this bus headed, barreling down the dirt road, completely full, <laughs> people hanging with their fingernails all around the bus. It's no seats. Everyone's hanging, falling off. It's crazy. My mouth is on the floor. I'm like, I am not getting on that thing. You know, I look through the dirty windshield and the driver has no intention of stopping. So <laughs> what happens is it slows down. It picks up speed. It never really stops. And so people run for it. And I'm thinking, I want to get hurt. You know, I'm going to get killed if I try mm-hmm. to catch this bus. So the bus went by. My cousin's frustrated. I'm just standing there in the middle of the road. <laughs> you know what happened? I said, you know, it's too full. There's no seats. There's no seats on this bus. He said, they're all the same. You've got to run. I said, I can't. This is, I'm going to wait for the next bus. So the next bus, I wait. And same thing. People hanging, falling on and off, you know, goes by. And my mind, you know, our mind, what are you doing, Bob? You get hurt, you fall down, you go to the hospitals. Have you seen the needles over here? You, know, you, you, start, you, you, you start creating this negative image of what could be possible, you know, in this scenario. And so the bus went by. Again, my cousin's frustrated. He's like, Bob, you are not from around here. You can't do this. Just come on. Let's go. And I said, no, no, no. I'm a New Yorker. I was a sales rep, I was a sales rep in Manhattan. I can do this. So he says, you know, whatever. So we're waiting. Finally, the third bus comes. Still no seats, you know, full, full to the brim with people. And again, you know, my mind, what are you doing, Bob? You're an executive. You don't need to be doing this. You know, the ego kicks in, right? And it tells us. So what I realized was that that moment was that my mind was holding me back. And what I observed was this, this little older lady standing next to me, and she was running. She was getting into motion. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, geez, if she can do it, why can't I? So I started getting into motion and I started walking and I found myself running. I caught the bus somewhere away and my mind shut off. As soon as I took action, my mind shut off and I caught the bus and I was about to slip off and some guy helped me back on the bus. John, I had no idea where we were going. <laughs> I had no idea where my cousin was at this point, but we were going somewhere. It was the most happiest moment in my life. So... So here's the moral of the story. Yeah. If you wait for the perfect bus, you're going to miss the best time of your life. Yeah. There is no such thing as perfection. What you have to do is stop waiting and start running and take action. And when you do, you're going to feel good and you get a consequence. The consequences of action could be negative or positive. If it's negative, well, don't do that. If it's mm-hmm. positive, do more of it. And what I, and you, what I also learned, John, is that if in life, you know, if you start taking action, you pursue something and you move forward, if you happen to fall, 
somewhere in the universe will send you a hand back up. Someone yeah. will come up. Yeah. I mean, my friend did that to me in my, you know, my journey in the beginning. He said, Bob, I'm going to India. Out of the blue, I got this phone call, you know, come with me and it changed my life. Mm-hmm. So I would say is, you know, the two things I would say, like you said earlier was, one is that we have to learn to give up control of things we can't control and focus on that and on ourselves and what we can control and do the thing, you know, the words you, you know, the use, the thoughts you think, the actions you take. And the second is don't wait for perfection yeah, because don't. there isn't any such thing. There's no perfect job, life, spouse, business, <laughs> career, employee, staff. There is no perfection. Perfection is an illusion of our no. mind trying to bring order to a life that has none. Yeah, I, 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 I love that, Bob, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a complete agreement with you. And I've, I've said this for years to people about exactly what you're saying about perfection. And I believe like perfection is a in some ways, perfection is a great get out of jail free card. Right. Because as you say, if I if I strive for perfection, I never really have to finish anything. I never really have to take a chance. I never have to put myself out there because everything isn't exactly perfect. And I, and I agree with you. I mean, we live, um, you know, we live in a world of chaos. Us of, of chaos in general, and and the thing is that yes, our jobs are never going to be perfect. Life is never going to be perfect, and you gotta you gotta take action and embrace the things in it that make it worthwhile, right? We have to go with the flow, and often I find myself, you know, when I was pitching in, in my sales jobs or business development jobs, John, you know, we prepare these you know these pitches, these presentations, mm-hmm. and we spend so much time on these massive slide decks that we create, or this beautiful thing. And when you talk to a customer, you got thirty seconds. Yeah. Like, oh my God. <laughs> and you're struggling, they oh, you really have to see this slide. Yeah. Care, it's done. <laughs> you know, and so you spend all this time on trying to perfect a slide deck, which the customer never sees. Mm-hmm. So what we have to really think about is okay. What are the most essential things I want to share with the customer at that moment when I want to pitch her and pitch him? And, you know, so you think those are the kind of things I say in your day to day is don't stress out about the PowerPoint, but, you know, focus on what the customer wants, what their needs are, what their problems are that you're trying to solve and have that conversation. It's not about the PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. It's not about trying to have even a perfect product. You know, the thing is, often if you have a cooked product, you know, a perfect product, you know, the customer says no, and that's it. And then you're like, oh, my God, my heart was broken. If you have an okay product, which you mold through the customer conversation and discussions, mm-hmm. mold that and that product becomes better, and the customer is more likely to use it. So actually, an imperfect product is more moldable. Right. And what you have to think about is, okay, I'm moldable. I'm imperfect. My product should be imperfect. It shouldn't be perfect. It should be imperfect so, like, the customer can help me mold it to a place where they can buy it. Because your goal is to sell the product. Mm-hmm. Whether it's perfect or imperfect doesn't really matter. It's yeah. So it's either have it imperfect so that the customer can help you mold it. So yeah. I think it, it relies, this, this this principle of, of don't wait for perfection, I think applies to not just sort of our lives in Absolutely. that sense but also in business and sales. No, I'm, I, I'm 100% with you. I would think like, you know, when you've got something to 85%, it's probably as good as it's ever going to yeah. be. And to be honest, if you invest in the other 15%, it often doesn't make any difference. No, yeah. no. Um, no. One, one other thing, uh, just touching on, you know, especially in sales, right? You know, sales is a lot of an attitude game as well, right? Um, I mean, do you think we take enough responsibility for our own mental attitude? Because like you said, I mean, we can find a thousand different things that aren't going our way. Um, right. And we can allow that to permeate into how we communicate or how we approach the day or whatever. I mean, what would you say to people? to get more of us to just sort of take responsibility for how we show up. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, John. I, I, I've been down that road sometimes myself, which is like, you know, you get ready in the morning, you do your rituals, you do your morning routine, you get, you get into that state of mind and you're great and, you know, you, you, you know, and the world crushes you, right? And then, you know, at like 4 o'clock, <laughs> you get a phone call or you have a conversation with somebody and you're just angry. You're like, ah, <laughs> you know, and you're like, you know, and then, you know, you go to bed and you're like, why did I do that? <laughs> I think it's like, I think you're absolutely right. It's, I think it's that we get so overwhelmed with the challenges from, you know, home life and the kids and whatever we've got to do, plus all the other things about our business and things. I think we have to really be aware. I think that's the most important thing I learned is to be more aware and mindful of what I'm saying, what I'm doing, and how I'm acting. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes back to is like, okay, how do you prepare your, you know, your physiology, you know? Right. And I give up, I know, I know it's, you know, 
it's hearsay for an old salesperson like me, but I gave up coffee many mm -hmm. years ago. I'm like, I can't do this anymore because the coffee was not good for me. Right. You know, and so it, it changed my physiology. And so I got better at being mindful of the, the challenges and the traps and all the stresses. And so I was able to be more aware of these things so I could take more responsibility for what I was doing. So, you know, being aware of what your your body, your mind, getting that in a good place. Also, you know, meditation to me has been very, very helpful mm -hmm. and clearing mind and giving me more productivity and focus. And so these are things I've taken. These are tools that I've learned over the years to help me be aware, be mindful and to go back to me and to fix me because I can't fix the world. Right. I can't fix the world. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's a that's a great point as well because I do think we spend a lot of time fixating on things, as I said, that are outside our control or big picture things that we have zero opportunity of ever uh, impacting, right? Yeah. And we'd be better off focusing on the things we can impact. So in the last in the last few minutes here, um, tell us another story about India, about something maybe one of the biggest surprises you had that you weren't expecting, or one of the things that's been most profound uh, in your life since. Yes. Well, one of the stories about India in my book, Embrace the Chaos, was um, and I went to a village in the middle of nowhere uh, to work with a social worker that delivers health care. He's not a doctor. He's not a pharmacist, nurse or anything. In these villages, they have nothing, right. no doctors, no public, you know, not even, you know, sort of restrooms in their homes. Uh, they have no toilets. They have no toilets in their homes. They have nothing. They don't, never heard of high blood pressure or that. Anyway, so we, I was working with this organization, and they they hired this person for two hundred dollars a month. Okay, this guy pays nothing, basically, to go and ask villagers in these villages about the problems that they have in their healthcare. And his job as a social worker for this NGO, for this non-governmental organization, was to take them to a doctor not too far away, you know, a couple hundred kilometers away, or a hospital to get them care. And so. Um, my company I was working with was supporting this NGO, so I was there to give them an audit to see what's going on in the field. So we go, I meet in the village with this guy, this fellow Prakash, he was like in his 30s, early 30s, and very kind fellow. So he takes me to the first hut, and there's a woman that comes out, brings her daughter out, very ill. He explains to me all the problems she has, and the woman is crying, the daughter has spinal problems, she can't get up, she's like, you know, about 10 or 11 years old, very difficult, emotional. We go to the next place and in the same thing there's lots of other kids other people so many problems and as we're walking through this village you know you realize the heaviness that you know the burden the emotional burden that that these people are carrying of the challenges of their health care and these kids and I asked Prakash as we're walking you know because I was getting really you know burned out mm -hmm. with it's just because like I can't do anything I talk yeah. to them I listen to them I touch them a hug whatever I could do but I'm not a doctor and so I asked him, Pakash, I said, you know, why do you do this job, you know? And he says, well, there's this woman tomorrow that I'm meeting in the village. And I'm like, no, 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 I know what you do, but why do you do it, you know? It's so hard, you know? And I didn't get an answer. So I just let it go. And the evening was over. We're about to go home. He's about to take like four buses home over two days to get home. I was in my van. I said, hey, you want a lift? So I gave him a lift. And I said to him, I said, I was drained, you know? There's no resources. There's no money. He's not a doctor. I said, Prakash, why do you do this job? You could be doing so many other things. Why do you do this? Why do you select to do this? And he said to me, he says, she's waiting for me tomorrow. And it hit me. We can get through anything in life if we have a person we are going to impact the next day. Okay? Our lives have meaning if we touch somebody else's life. This woman in this village tomorrow that he was going to meet was supposed to meet him. You know, he met her three, four months ago. And he committed to meeting her tomorrow because he wanted to check in on her and blood pressure. She's waiting for him and he can't let her down. He right. can't let her down. And so what I realized in my own life, contribution is the is the is the, the source of so much of the things we can get through chaos. We can get through chaos if there's somebody on the other end we can help. Mm -hmm. And often in my life I realized it's the small things. It was my assistant who was working with me. She had a challenge and you know, I would come to work just for her sometimes to help right. her out, you know. And so I think that's really one core lesson I learned is if, you, if you're going through a difficult time, think about who you can serve, who you can give, who you can contribute to, whose life you can make different, whether it's a customer, a colleague, mm -hmm. you know, a friend, a family member or your own family, whatever that is, whoever that is, that is what moves us. It's not the money. 
Right. You know, a lot of times in sales, we think, oh, yes, we want to perform to make accolades for ourselves, but we're adding value to somebody's mm -hmm. life, some yeah. way, shape, or form. And so that cause, you know, contribution, uh, a person, a person, having a connection with a person can pull you forward through anything in life. So that's one of the biggest lessons I learned. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic lesson. And, uh, you know, if I paraphrase in some ways, it's like get out of your own head and focus yeah. on some other people, right? That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, this has been fantastic. Bob Miglani, um, a best-selling author, Embrace the Chaos. It's a, it would be available on Sales Pop uh, as well in our bookstore. Um, Bob, is there anything else that you'd like to tell people about yourself before we go today? No, I love speaking. I'm a keynote speaker in a lot of different ways. I write and I blog. So check me out on LinkedIn. And my name is Bob Miglani. And uh, thank you very much for having me, John. Great talking to you today. Yeah, great talking to you. And, um, you know, obviously, we'd love to see you speak sometime because I could listen to these stories all day. And um, <laughs> I'd love the book, too. All right. Uh, again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, and CRM. See you all again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.